God bless you today. It's always a joy to have you here. Your thousand dollars cannot reproduce until it enters into a covenant with the Lord. Westboro Baptist Church will picket their funeral. You can put that thousand dollars. We will remind the living that you can still repent and obey. Live from the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah, this is Heart of the Matter, where biblical Christianity meets American evangelicalism face to face. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. The questions continue to come, probably because of my inability to uh, clarify the answers. Uh, the following is a representative of dozens of questions we've been getting. Sean, are you going to be able to post your NRB shows where I can watch maybe on YouTube? Because everything changed when we were kicked off uh, the television here in Utah, the reorganization has taken some time and uh, both to implement and to get used to and then for me to explain. So let me try again and, and just try and listen so that you can understand what has happened, all right? First, all the programs that we have filmed in the past while we were on TV here in Utah, they are being replayed on the NRB network on Fridays and Tuesdays. You access the NRB network through three ways, DirecTV, uh, Sky Angel, and Roku. Those are the primary ways. If you tune into the NRB Sky Angel or Roku and you look at the NRB channel on Tuesdays and Fridays, you are going to see replays of our seven years of exposing Mormonism for what it is. Okay? So, and remember, all of the programs that you see on the NRB network are available now, archived at HOTM.TV. So you can go to that, you can just look up anyone you want up, but if you have people who you want to introduce to the program, have them turn to the NRB and they can watch those uh, tapes. Okay. Then every week, brand new Heart of the Matter American Evangelical evangelicalism is, are being taped. That's what you're watching right now. You're on the HOTM site and you've clicked streaming. You are watching new programs. Will this be uploaded to our website? They will in time. But because of the chaos and getting a new building and moving and all kinds of other factors, it's taking time. But you can watch them on YouTube. And I think we can put up an address for YouTube for you. You can see them on our YouTube channel. It's HOTM Show. I think it's all one word. And you can watch any of those uh, there. Finally, we're also working on getting our verse by verse through Matthew and Romans. It took us 18 months to get through both of those books verse by verse. They are going to be uploaded to the campus site and there's a there's a uh, uh, website address there for you on the screen so that is essentially how it all comes down when you're constantly juggling resources and manpower to stay afloat uh, this is kind of how um, uh, things play out so just be patient with us and it will all work out uh, you know we were really content with uh, uh, being on TV 20 here in Utah and uh, we I had no desire to try to really push it out there and get out there bigger and bigger but God had other plans so instead of reaching 150,000 households potential households through TV 20 here in Salt Lake we are now through the NRB network uh, reaching a, a, a potential of 26 million through the uh, shows for Mormonism and then of course this streaming programs another deal so we'll see how that works out we thank we uh, God we praise him we and and we're grateful for all that he uh, has done and continues to do keep us in your prayers in a bit of good news uh, on January 1st of this year I went after many of the larger lawyers local churches for things I saw. Well, uh, a couple of the larger churches have made announcements. They are churches of size and substance that from the pulpit, they have said, one church said, you know, we have gotten away from teaching the word. That is so important. And we've realized we need to get back to that. So there's an improvement. Another church has said, our 
worship, we have taken our focus off what worship should be, and they've downplayed all the electrical instruments and uh, the drum synthesizers and, and the, everything, and they've gone to acoustic. And, and so I applaud that. And I think it's just wonderful if people are trying to get more to what the New Testament church looked like. Um, I know my person and my boldness really rubs people the wrong way, especially people in authority and, and pastors. Um, so for them to hear me rebuke and then take action in some ways to change things shows me a lot of humility and a love for their flock. And I just pray that more churches in Utah, and the reason I would, I would say things about the church is because we're concerned about the Latter-day Saints coming out. You know, if you were privy to our emails and you could hear what they say, where do we go to church? We've tried this place. We've tried that place. We've tried this place. And it really takes a strong uh, ability to assimilate into this new culture. So we were saying we think that this, these improvements should be made. We don't regret saying them at all. Uh, but really uh, great to hear that some churches are taking that up. We hope more will. Listen, we are going to be taking calls probably beginning next week. There's a device we need to get. We know that makes the show what it is. Uh, and so we're waiting to get that device. And when we do, uh, probably next week, have more patience. Uh, had the blessing of speaking at the Concerned Christians Conference uh, this past week in Phoenix, Arizona. Really had a great time. Many people there were seeking truth, coming out of Mormonism, etc. We want to give our thanks to Andy and Bob, everybody at Concerned Christians out of Mesa, Arizona, who hosted it. In case you're not aware, Andy Poland hosts a radio show uh, where he interviews people who have left Mormonism. It's very effective. We have on the screen where you can uh, check out when those shows and where those shows air in your neighborhood and area. Our good friend, uh, our good friend, Wendy, uh, forwarded this interesting website to us. Uh, it's on the screen, and what they do on this website is you put in the date that you went through the LDS temple, and you put in your secret name, and then the more people that do that, they correlate to see if they can prove that they use the same secret name for everybody on that given day in temples all over the world. Now, I can tell you right now they do. Uh, but nevertheless, it's an interesting project because they literally lay out how it works and they have verification like five people have said that they went through on April 2nd of 1986, the temple, and all five have said their name was Alma. And uh, what it does is... I mean, the LDS might take great exception to that because you're not supposed to reveal that name. But what it does is it allows people to see the system and the machinery behind the giant and how it works. Because when you go through and you're unaware, you think that's a special thing given to you alone between you and God. And really, they're handed out in mass on those days to everybody in every temple in the world. Maybe it will cause a Mormon to come out of the box, climb out of it at least, maybe walk away altogether. Uh, what I'm about to report on breaks uh, my heart. There's an online uh, site here in Utah, a company called Orbits Utah. Uh, no, it's not Orbits, excuse me, Obits Utah. And they claim to run obituaries at a cheaper rate than the newspapers do. Anyway, Obits Utah ran uh, an obituary this last week. And you can't see this. We're not going to focus in on that. But this is a copy of the, of the page. And it has the name and picture of a young man in a, in a sh dark suit and a tie and a white shirt. And it shows that he was all of uh, 19 years of age, looks like, maybe 18. And it says uh, he passed away on April 9th in Ogden with his family by his side. When he was born, he graduated from this high school, LDS Seminary, worked at this market. He did this. He enjoyed this. Uh, and he was called to serve in the Boston, Massachusetts LDS mission at the time of his death. They go on and say who he's left behind and, and where the funeral services will be held. What they don't tell you, uh, and our sources have told us, that he killed himself the day before he was to leave on the mission. And he killed himself because he didn't want to go on the mission. But he didn't have any way of communicating that to somebody who, I guess, would hear him. Um, what would cause a young man this age to take his own life. Um, instead of standing up to the pr immense pressure that is placed upon him and so many others, um, 
he decided to take this later course of action. This is just another example of the LDS machine chewing up and spitting out anyone who will not or does not or in this case cannot uh, conform to its relentless demands. For some, it's easy to go on the mission. For some, it's a great time. They enjoy it, the whole thing. But for others, it's not. But the pressure is so intense upon them. We see evidence of this and many other things like this. We have other uh, information that we've talked about. It's not an isolated uh, case. And I would suspect that since the LDS Church has lowered the, uh, the, day, the age of serving to 18, we are going to see more and more of stuff like this coming out of these young guys. Now think about this, folks. Just think. A person killing themselves over duty to a church. Killing themselves over duty to a church. The whole concept is antithetical to the freedom and peace that Christ is supposed to bring in a Christian church. There's something majorly wrong with the, with the picture. I don't understand why the fathers and mothers of the LDS church aren't rising up and demanding a different attitude toward the young people. Before you criticize me for reporting on this story and this family's loss, and I'm very sorry for it, ask yourself, how do you explain this death? If you're LDS, how do you explain this death to me? Okay? Do you put the blame on him? That's probably what people do secretly. Oh, you know, he just, he just failed. Or do you, do, you, do you think he was weak? Do you blame Satan, that he was overcome by Satan? Do you blame his parents for not being communicative and, or his community? Or do you put the blame where it should squarely fall? That is on the church that has created a culture where a young man cannot voice his opinion freely and say, I don't want to go on a mission. And people say, well, that's okay. There's other things you can do. I want to see the day when an LDS prophet will stand up in general conference and say something like this. You know, full-time missions are really great. We've seen them do a lot of good. I personally, Sean McCraney, loved my full-time mission. Full-time missions are a great experience, but you know, they're not for everybody. If you don't feel like you are led uh, to go on one, uh, don't worry about it. I, as your prophet, seer, and revelator, you know, I, I want you to go forward and have a blessed life and find another way to serve the Lord. There's no pressure. If you want to go, we're here to help you. Why can't they say things like that? The reason they can't is because they use people to feed the machine. And if those people aren't feeding the machine, the coffers don't grow, the property uh, acquisitions don't continue, and the men in power and their money, uh, which if you follow the trail is insane, and information is coming out uh, about that through D. Michael Quinn, through stuff through... Um, uh, uh, Grant Palmer, more and more we're hearing about the payoff that these guys at the top get of this and they need to have it. So uh, I would petition that you guys rise up and say, hey, enough is enough. Here on last week's show, we spent some time exploring fundam fundamentalism's faith healing. Uh, the topic or my coverage of it brought a number of co uh, complaints, some supportive, but more complaints. Faithful viewer Steve A. wrote in and said, Sean, on your Tuesday 4, 9, 13 live episode, you seem to strongly suggest that we as believers don't have healing powers or authority over unclean spirits. You stated that these powers were only given to the apostles that were dis, uh, discipled directly by Jesus incarnate. I have to disagree. I have to strongly disagree. And I bring to light Mark 16, 16 through 18. Well, let's read that together, all right? It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak in new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. The writer, Steve, continues to me saying, These verses clearly state that power over unclean spirits and healing and gifts are given to those who believe on him, not exclusively on just the original 12. 
Correct the wrongs, Sean. Please don't sow seeds of doubt for those who hang on every one of his promises. He said all things are possible to them that believe. Faith is our everything. Please don't work to destroy that sincerely in the Lord, Steve. Well, I appreciate his comments because they give me a chance to clarify a few things and to show you that using scripture to fortify a position is not unique to the LDS. We just saw an example, and Steve is a friend of mine. He's a, I don't know him personally, but he's a supporter of the ministry. And, and yet he has used scripture to, con, to non-contextually support his argument of what he said. So, first of all, like I said last week, I believe in divine healings. Don't get me wrong. In fact, I believe all healings that we experience in this world are divine. Whether they come from the hands of someone who has the gift of healing to a doctor. Healings are divine. Um, that being said, it is God who chooses whether somebody is healed or not. And I reiterated last week, if somebody has an infected arm and God does not want that arm to be healed and he wants that person to lose that arm for whatever reason he has, no doctor and no faith healer in the world and no individual's amount of faith is going to change that, that course, in my opinion. Now, I know there's, there's stories in the Old Testament that talk about these things, but in my opinion, from what I read, I think in this day and age, that's how it works. Uh, this, to, to trust in God in these things and to say, God, if you choose to take my arm, I have faith in this, that's faith in God. That's walking by faith. To say, if my child dies, I trust in you. We have a perfect example in David. When his son was sick, David fasted and prayed and fasted and prayed and fasted and prayed. And then he got word, knock, knock, knock on the door. Hey, David, he passed away. David gets up, takes a bath and starts eating. The Jews are saying, wait a minute. Now's the time we were supposed to be mourning. David said, look, I did. I prayed. I trusted in God to, to take care of him. He didn't. I, I accept it. And he goes on and then he just eats. That is really the proper perspective of it. Last week I mentioned that I believe many of the passages pulled from Jesus in the New Testament about faith healing were specifically given to his uh, 12 apostles. He was training them for what they were going to do when they went out into the world to prove that he resurrected and that, he, that they were his 12. They would have the gift in healings. According to Steve, the passage he supplied us with says all believers are equipped with this power to heal and handle poisonous snakes, etc. But the context of these passages in Mark 16, 16 through 18, support my point. Let me show you why, okay? Go back two verses. Mark gave us, I mean, Steve gave us those passages. Go back with me two verses at verse 14. Are you ready? It says, Afterward, Jesus appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye all into the world, and preach to every the gospel to every creature. That is the context of what he says next. He was sitting with the eleven. He upbraids them for not believing that he had risen and he talks to them about faith and he says, now go out into all the world and teach the gospel. This is when Steve's passages come in where he says, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe. He's talking to his 11 who are going to go out, 12 if you include Paul, and they're going to go out in Jesus' name. These are the signs that follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly it shall not hurt them and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover those were directives to the 12 Un, what, not what Steve said Steve said that and what he did was he said these signs are, uh, will follow them that believe but he's talking to those guys who showed a lack of belief that he had risen that's called context so in my opinion, I think these passages show he was still teaching them. And uh, to use these verses on believers today is errant because it places the onus of having faith upon us. And if someone isn't healed, it's because we lack the faith. That is not the, uh, I just don't believe that for a second. That's why we can couch it in Jesus and how he was working with his 12 who are special witnesses doing what they needed to do. I'm not undermining the importance of faith. I just think faith needs to be appropriately focused, and that means it's on him and him alone to do his will, and we then believe and comply. Another disappointed viewer wrote, 
She was bothered that I, quote, named names when talking about many of today's faith healers. She said, I was in full support of looking at ourselves, meaning this year that you're going to be examining Christianity. But when you basically name names and held all faith healers up as fakes and false teachers, my heart sank. When I was a little girl, my family would sit around watching Catherine Kuhlman and make fun of her. Now I love her and realize she was used of God. Such awesome miracles, she said. Kenneth Hagin was healed off his deathbed having learned what God's word said. God used him mightily and many were healed as well. I could go on. But the point is we are supposed to spread the gospel message and healing should naturally follow. I know you said God still heals today but you seemed antagonistic to those he uses, she writes. Sure there are some who are in it for the money but I don't think many of the ones on the list you gave are. First of all, uh, uh, somehow we have embraced this idea that to name names is inappropriate as Christians, that a Christian would never name name. And uh, what happens as a result is something far worse. Everyone walks around making Christian uh, uh, inferences, which are hypocritical. You know, now I'm, I'm not going to name names, but there's a tall redheaded woman uh, with two sons who drives a black Ford. She lives by the mall and she was seen with my best friend's husband. I'm not naming names. So that's what goes on. You know, this, this game of, you know, God kind of understands, you know, you're going to be better off by not saying, you know, we are not talking about private individuals here. We're not talking about gossip here. We're talking about public figures who are on television, I, I get the scrutiny, bring it on. Public figures go on television and they say they are healing these people, they are showing the healings being done, they should have their names named and they should be called under scrutiny. Laura also said, sure there are some who are in it for the money, but I don't think many on the list you gave qualify. Uh, or are like Peter Popoff, who I used as an example last week. So let's look at the people I named, and what we're going to do is we're going to give you their name, and then we're going to give you a, a site uh, where you can look up and you can see firsthand documented evidence of their deception. Okay? And that I, I, I do so that you can see these people are not as clear as you think. Oral Roberts. First of all, go read an article in the Presbyterian Outlook written in 1955 by Carol R. Stegall, uh, who was an associate pastor in the Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, page 163-164. Go and read the documented evidence, and it's just, a, it's just the tip of the iceberg, about our good brother Oral Roberts, who's really the grandfather sort of, of modern-day evangelical uh, fundamentalist healings on TV. Amy Simple McPherson, give me a break. Give me a break. Um, you can go and look up online of the, of the uh, recent play uh, about her life. You know what they titled it? Scandalous. That's the name of the title. Go look up the play and check the facts. Check the facts on all of this. Just like we tell Mormons, check the facts. Check the facts on this. Catherine Kuhlman, go to a spiritual-research-network.com and read all about the uh, deceptions and frauds of Catherine Kuhlman. Now, if they're guilty of some frauds, like Joseph Smith was guilty of some frauds, aren't they under scrutiny? We spend so much time. We say, look at what the Mormons do. Look at what the Mormons do. And why don't we look at our own house? Are we afraid? I'm not afraid. My faith is in a God and King who came and I know and he lived and he died. That's where my faith is. Let's examine our own house. Marjo Gortman, a full documentary expose has been made on this uh, person. Go and Google Marjo, M-A-R-J-O-E, documentary film. You can watch it online. Peter Popoff, covered him last week. Benny Hinn, do I really need to say more? Uh, go to deceptioninthechurch.com deceptioninthechurch.com you can read from first hand accounts listen when I went to Calvary Chapel School of Ministry Chuck Smith if he doesn't like me saying this too bad he told us he said I know people who were paid by him to come up and feign an injury or something an illness and to come back the following day and do the same thing again so uh, that is from 
I mean, it's hearsay, I guess, in a court of law, but it's from Pastor Chuck Smith to my ear and a number of other guys that were trained under him who knew, knew uh, Benny Hinn, whose headquarters is just down the road in Southern California. And yet the owners of the television station that we got kicked off of, they traveled around with the guy. They support him tremendously. This stuff is, is it needs to be exposed. Uh, Kenneth Hagan died in 2003. Go to the word on the word of faith. Dot com. The word on the word of faith dot com. Type in Kenneth Hagan. Do your research. Ron Parsley, the forgotten word dot com. W. V. Grant, who is an expert in the supposed leg lengthening thing. I don't know if you ever heard of this, but you can take somebody who has a gimp and you take their leg and you lengthen it and then they're able to walk clearly and they can show you how they can actually bring that leg out. And all of this is like, it's like pulling while you're moving your hands at the same time and it appears like the leg is growing. It's not growing. It's a, it's a total carnival trick. And he was really good at that, uh, W.V. Grant. And Kenneth Copeland, deceptioninthechurch.com. Check out the facts. If I'm wrong, I'll make a public apology, but I'm not. And these, are, these represent millions of innocent people who are wasting their time and money and emphasis on the wrong focus when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In her email, Laura actually said in relation to the name she named... Catherine Coleman is having done such wonderful miracles. And Kenneth Hagan, she says, God has used mightily and healed many. I have to admit great intrigue when otherwise good, solid, believing Christians will make such statements like this. Have they actually witnessed a miracle by one of these faith healers or are they just regurgitating their hopes, their, their gullible belief, their naivete that somebody is doing these types of things. And when I ask, have they actually witnessed a faith healing miracle? What I mean by this is, is a person actually brought to them who was really ill. We talked about these categories last week. They were brought to a faith healer. That faith healer makes them truly well and they remain well from that faith healing for the rest of their lives. That's what the way my God would heal somebody. If you were blind and he gave you sight, I don't think the people who received their sight were blind again later on. I think that Jesus healed them. He's a perfect healer. He's the, he's the, he's the, physician, the, phys, the great physician. He heals. They're healed. There's none of this, well, I was healed, but it came back on me, uh, I, you know, in my opinion. Uh, this type of investigation is just as important to the Christians, and there's going to be a number of others that we talk about, as those challenges we gave to the LDS over the years. Question, challenge, seek out your faith and decide what is real and what is not. Lies, deception, fraud, all originate from the same source. Same source. And just because someone says they're Christian, uh, it does not exempt them from exposing fraudulent behavior and then turning their back on such. Anyway, before we explore this topic just a little bit more tonight, let's have a prayer. Because if I'm wrong, and I, I leave it open, I could be wrong about this. If I am, I will repent. And I, I want God to show me I'm wrong. And, to, and to, I'm going to investigate like I investigated anything. I want to know if I'm wrong, you will see me in ashes and sackcloth repenting. But if I'm right, I want him to give me the power to prove it to others. And so let's pray and then we'll continue on. Lord, we need you in our lives. You are the truth, capital T. Because you are the truth, you encompass all truth, create all things, the great physician, we rely on you and you alone. So we pray that you will enlighten our minds and eyes through your Holy Spirit. Free us from the shackles of religious deceptions and the false prophets and the predators and the wolves who are out there, which you warned about. Don't let us become uh, 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 entangled with the, the wares that they push upon a, uh, a, a unsuspecting and faith-filled world who seeks to honor you in so many ways, but is taken advantage of, Lord. We pray we'll open your book and discern truth like the Bereans. We'll discover what is real, what is not, and we will use your word as the barometer for all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Interestingly enough, last week um, I did the show on faith healing, and uh, I had a, uh, received a voicemail from a man uh, uh, prior to doing the show, and I didn't listen to the voicemail. I think he sent it on Tuesday morning because we were busy. And uh, 
when I did listen to it, he said that there was a traveling pastor in town that he really felt inclined to introduce me to, this, this traveling pastor. So intrigued, I called him on Thursday and he explained this man, and we're gonna call him Charles, uh, was from Kanab, Utah and was going to be in Salt Lake City preaching. So for some reason, he said, for some reason, the spirit wanted him to get me to meet Charles. And, uh, and uh, for some reason, I said, is this man a faith healer? And he paused for a minute and he said, yes, yes he is. So uh, the, the, this guy called me before we did the show. So I was very intrigued and I told him, uh, he said they would be speaking on Friday night at a place. So I called another friend of mine, RJR, who believes in faith healing and always has and invited him to go with me and he said he would. And so we went and uh, we, we, we got to the place. The event was held in this retirement type community thing. It was nice. and. Uh, in the room when we walked in were about 12 elderly people from the home and um, sitting around the room, a uh, half dozen young adults and maybe 10 other people, some sitting alone, some who are with spouses, uh, me and RJR. Charles, the faith healer from Kanab, Utah started in and he started preaching, talking about the word of God and about the meaning of numbers, number one, number two, number three, number four, all the way through up to like, I forget, 12 or something, 13, and tying it into this kind of, kind of uh, system which is prevalent in scripture, and it was interesting. And uh, he was kind of like machine gunning a lot of passages out there on a number of topics, and his tone was quite kinetic, and he was kind of building this, this this thing about the word. And I, I appreciated the fact that he was really emphasizing the need to study the word. That was where he started. I was really intent on hearing what he had to say. I listened very closely to what he had to say and the scriptures that he cited. Uh, I noticed he used terms and I wrote it down in my notes several times and what most people don't know and what most people don't know and what you need to know about this is uh, what I want to share with you to give you insight on this is so there was a lot of kind of Gnostic knowledge that he had discovered through years of being in the word I could sense this buildup coming and noticed the references to the word started to, to Dwayne or wane a little sorry Dwayne sorry to wane off a little bit and then he started to bring in healing this healing experience that he had had and he segued fully into it and for a solid 15 or 20 minutes he prepped us with information relative to the healings that he had been exposed to and seen as a young man. I guess his father was a faith healer and he, he was uh, much of the rhetoric orbited around the latter rain movement, which was popular among evangelical, I'm not evangelicals, among uh, uh, Pentecostals back in the day when he was young. And, and he used names that I had talked about on the show, Amy Simple McPherson and um, Oral Roberts, and, and he used these names. And what he was doing, we also described on the show. I could, I could watch it unfold before my eyes. Uh, apparently, Charles cut his teeth on his daddy uh, being a faith healer, and he used this as kind of a badge to say, I really am in a place of authority to be able to do what we're going to do tonight. Uh, he also said over and over, I counted four times, but it seemed like over and over, you can't imagine the stories I could tell. I could tell thousands of stories about this. You don't know the stories I could tell, okay? So he repeated that, and then he started to get specific. And between each amazing story he would kind of share, he would say, I could tell you a thousand just like it. So he's building up this hope. He's building up this, this desire to kind of see, hey, you know, wow, this is amazing. I can participate in this. Uh, I kind of felt ignored to tell you the truth. I mean, he had experienced thousands and thousands of healings. I just wanted one. I, I was just looking for one experience. So the pump was being primed. A young woman from the back excitedly said, tell us about the young African boy who raised the dead. And he was like, oh yeah. And so he goes into the, telling the story. Of course, last week we said, it's always in Africa, isn't it? He, she literally said about the young African boy who raised the dead. And uh, every time he would talk, the crowd would kind of, ooh, a oh, little bit of that. This is part of the process. And let me explain how it works. If you hear over the radio, someone saying, hey, the, a great comedian is coming to town. He's gonna be at the Salt Palace. You gotta hear this guy. Uh, Jimmy John, he is the greatest comedian on earth. And there's a laugh track. 
<laughs> and Jimmy John's coming. When you go to that experience, you will automatically prep yourself to laugh. He could get up there and say, oh, my thumb hurts. <laughs> because you've been prepped for the experience and you show up to the experience waiting for the laughter to come. Somebody, if you meet Jimmy John on the street and he pulls some of the same stuff and you're not prepped, you might not think he's funny at all. You just say, well, that was, that was really strange. That wasn't funny at all. But when you're prepped psychologically for it, you go in. So that's what they do. They prep you. You're going to come to it. First of all, everybody there has an expectation. Some were expecting to see healings. Some, like me, were expecting to see fraud. So I could I easily admit, maybe I was jaded. Maybe my eyes were blinded to what was going on. That's possible because the same dynamics work whichever side you're playing on. So the question is, is God healing people through these faith healers? That's the question. I would say the healing is of God if three factors absolutely exist. I touched on them a minute ago. The first one is, does the person have a legitimate medical condition? Um, if they have cancer, has it been determined through biopsy? Uh, are they truly blind? Are they really deaf? Are they truly missing an arm? Okay? Really not there. Or is it truly crippled and it's been crippled since they were a kid or from an accident or something like that? There's, there's, you see, because we're looking for evidence. Our faith is not placed like the LDS on myths and on just dreams. It's placed upon evidence. So if someone goes up with the hand that looks like this, we ask the parents, we ask the school teachers, was the hand always like that? Well, no, I think that he, something happened and he just got that or whatever. So you have to do your homework. Is it real? To say somebody, for instance, is depressed and that the healing relieved them of their depression, it, to me, is, is vague. We all experience ups and downs of depression and I can run into a happy person who will take me out of my depression and make me feel better. So when they, when they resort to that type of stuff, I don't believe in it. Also, if somebody has a pain in their leg, you know, I've got a pain in my leg for the past six months, and you go and you touch the leg and you rub it and you rub the shoulder and you whisper to them and you're rubbing their neck and you're talking to them, the Lord loves you and stuff, you feel better. It's like going to a chiropractor. You go to a chiropractor and you stand up, you feel better. Have they done anything? I don't know. But you feel better with the hands on and the soft touching and the praying, you're gonna feel better. And then you couple that with the expectation to see and feel a healing in that experience, you're gonna have a very heightened experience. I throw addiction in the same boat. A demon possession, I throw in the same boat as depression and a, poor, and a sore leg. So we note that Jesus and his disciples, when they healed, they healed people who were, boom, proven, proven very ill. The guy who was lame, he knew was known in the community front, the, the, the Sanhedrin called his parents and said, hey, listen, this guy was born blind, right? Yeah, he, all we know is he was born blind. He was blind. The lame man sat by the pool of Bethsaida, could not get up, and everybody knew that he couldn't get up. These people, the, the lepers, really had leprosy. Uh, all of those things were there. They truly were ill or defective. That's the first qualifier. The second one is, have they truly been healed? Meaning, has the leper's spots and, and, and hair and everything been healed? Has the hand which was withered, like the guy in the, uh, that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, did it stretch out complete, full, whole? Does a limb that's missing come back? Okay, if you're, if you're doing healings on things that are kind of sketchy, it's easy to say a healing's taken place. I want one where a, heal, where a sickness existed and the healing actually healed. The third qualifier is, uh, and, uh, does the healing remain? If God is doing the healing, I can't imagine God through the faith of somebody who believes on him saying, Lord, just give me my sight and God giving them their sight to three months later taking it away. Or somebody who has had the pain in the leg and it doesn't go away and they go and they get healed when they get the massage and they say, but, the, but three months later it's back. But the Lord healed me for that short time or the healer healed. No way. I, I, God is a perfect healer. He's not going to partially heal somebody. He's going to give them the full boat. That's what he does with salvation. You know, that's what. He, so those are the qualifiers. All right. 
Charles told a story about a woman named Laura who was in a coma and on her deathbed. He was called to come to the hospital where the whole family was gathered around. Charles said he, he steps into the room and they're gathered around there. I don't recall the details, but long story short, he called her forth in the name of Jesus and she sat up in the bed. She was raised from being in a coma on her deathbed as verified by medical doctors. The family gathered to say her last goodbyes and she rose up and was healed. Well, at this point, I couldn't contain myself. So I raised my hand and I said, I really appreciate your focus on the word. That was great. But I'm a cynic of cynics. And you just said that there was a woman who was in a coma and she was on her deathbed. You walked into the hospital room and in the name of Jesus, you healed her. Sean, I did, I did not say I healed her. So he, he, he fixed me on that one really quick. I did not say I healed her. Okay. He interrupted me. Okay. You, and he made a big deal of it to everybody. I don't heal anybody. It's, okay. I was wrong. The Lord healed this woman, Laura, through you. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I can. All right. Will you prove it? Can you prove it? Uh... Of course I can prove it, came the reply. Uh, no problem, I have documentation of it right on my desk at home. Okay, good, I said. So you're gonna prove, I just reiterated, that Laura was on her deathbed in a coma, you walked into the room, you were able, I made the mistake again, to raise Sean, and then he goes off. I did not, and he makes a big deal out of it. Okay, wait, my fault, my fault. Jesus, through you, was able to come in and he raised her from the coma and uh, that's how it worked. And he said he could prove that. And he looked at the rest of the audience and he began to talk about faithlessness. And the audience started talking about people who don't believe. And uh, uh, he said, I, so I just reiterated, can you prove it? And he said, I can prove that in a thousand other stories. I said, Charles, I don't want a thousand. I just want one. I want to believe. I want to believe in this. But I got to have some kind of proof that is other than just people saying, well, there is this person in Africa, or I know this person, my cousin's cousin, whose mother's fell and hurt her toe and all that stuff. Just give me something to stand on like we have in the word of God. So I said to the audience, now you've all heard this, Charles, he said he can prove this. I'm going to hold him to that. I said I would pay him $500 if he would prove it to me. He said, oh, I don't want your money. And uh, I said, well, if you prove it to me, Charles, I will go on a, a television program and I will go on a, a website program and I'll repent for my faithfulness. I'll call you a true faith healer. And I'll admit that my stance on this stuff has been wrong, that I've been a man without faith. I want you to prove it and I will, I will turn. So Charles and the members of the audience kept talking. They, then they all started talking about their individual healings. They started booing each other up. One guy talked about a healing he had of his shoulder. Another lady talked about a healing of being sick and sick. But none of their healing stories fit the three things I just talked about. None of them. They were all like I had a pain and it just, just wouldn't go away. And pains go away on their own sometimes. And God heals too. But through a faith healer, I don't know. Charles then moved into the actual healing phase of the service. And he said, is there anyone out there struggling or having a problem with a tingling in their foot? I raised my hand because my foot does tingle at times. Uh, and so he said, you, you have a tingling problem, Sean? I said, yes. Well, come on up. So I went up and, and here I am. Sit down, Sean. He sits me down. He starts rubbing my foot, moving it around. Wiggle your toes for me, Sean. Wiggle my toes. He's massaging it through my boot. And then after he's done doing that, he says, now walk. So I walked and he says, now doesn't that feel better? I said, yeah, you just massaged it. <laughs> and he, everybody in the whole, you know, this is not a man of faith. I, I, I mean, what can I say? So then uh, 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 more people start coming forward. Uh, a woman with a back problem. He spends time with his hands on her, whispering in her ear, rubbing her arms, having her sit on her chair and put her, her chest down on her uh, uh, legs so she's stretching. He then, then he pulled the old leg stretcher trick. Well, these don't seem too out of line. He, he did that. And then he has her stand up and walk. She stands up and walks and she says, I feel better. And I'm dying. I'm like, of course you feel better. And people are like, you know, oh, you know, and 
I'm sorry for this cynicism for you out there who love this stuff. I'm sorry that I'm saying this. And this stuff is as painful to you as my saying that Joseph Smith was a fraud. And it's painful to the Latter-day Saints. Lies, when, they're, when they are open to you, are painful to receive. And that's the only point I'm trying to make. We want real faith on real things, right? So he goes on and he says all this other stuff. And then he comes up and he said, in the midst, after healing different people for different others, one woman came with a drug problem. He kept calling it pharmacaea. He spoke in tongues at this point, and he started doing it, and it always sounds like Arabic. And he's doing this, which is totally unbiblical, in how tongues are supposed to be. There is no interpreter. We're looking, using the Bible as our guide. He's and she is feeling better, and he starts saying, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. He's curing you, and he's bringing this into her. He's whispering it to her. He's rubbing her, and then when she's done, I feel better. And he turns, he says, you know, I'm going to have a hard time, Sean. Uh, I'm going to give you my cell phone right now you call that you call a woman back in texas he she will be able to verify that uh laura was healed i said i'm not calling anybody you're going to get the medical records that are sitting right on your desk you fax them to me or send them to me and we'll go for, well it's going to be hard to do because she's she's gone this was 14 years ago i said well then you can't prove it to me can you charles I, we have things we have two blind women who were healed right here I, uh, two blind, you heal two blind women, I said. So what they do, this is part of the con. When it's, when it's not working with one thing, and he has to kind of come clean with the one thing, he's going to really bring the audience in by bringing in more. So he brings in two blind people that he says last year he healed right here. I said, right here in this room? He, oh, Sean, not here in this room. Here in, you, you mean in Salt Lake City? I said, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, I'll take that any day. Can you prove that those, those men were blind? They were women, Sean. You can prove those women were blind and that you healed them and they now can see? Yes, I can. You got it. I'll take that any day. You show me someone who was blind and you were able to heal them. I am a follower of faith healing. I will repent. I can do it. I've been waiting. He's been home now. Let's see. He's been home probably three or four days. I'm waiting. I would think he would just pick up that evidence and show me. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for somebody, one of you, to show me empirical data that any of these faith healers that are on TV today have healed somebody of a documented disease through their faith healing practices like we've talked about those three categories i will send you a 500 dollars check 500 dollars check if you can submit to me proof medical proof they had cancer diagnosed through biopsy they were healed they were blind they could see they were completely deaf as by doctors they could hear by a faith healer, not by God, not someone who prays and God heals. I believe in that. But by a faith healer, you prove it to me, you show me, you have a $500 check right now. All right? So it goes on. We're almost wrapping it up. And then I watch uh, him spout off about healing a whole room full of people. And he's just, he's just making the mountain bigger and bigger. Why, there was, everybody in that room was healed that night. He's just making the stories just so large that people in the room are ready to kill me. And they're just, just so enamored by his claims. And then we watch a man who I met before the thing started. He was a pilot and he had a stroke. And he was on a, a, a walker, uh, not a walker, but he had a thing. And he was all, one half of his body was slumped over and he got up to leave. And uh, I said, why don't you heal him? And he said, okay. So he brings this guy up. He says, you know, you know, strokes are a tough one. <laughs> strokes are a tough one, he says. Uh, you know, my friends, honest to God, my heart broke over this. I mean, I know I called that guy out, but you know, it, it, it's for everyone's benefit. And the man said he was willing, so he went up and he rubbed the guy and he talked to him and he did all the same stuff and while he was doing that I swear to you I was praying to God heal this man I, I prayed please show me that you're going to heal this man through this faith healers 
uh, uh, faith and through this whole process, Lord. And I wanted that man to be free. I wanted nothing more than that guy to stand up straight, throw his cane aside, and walk out of there. And I would have fallen on my face, cried. I would have cried before those people and God, saying, I am sorry that I have doubted you. But it didn't happen. You know what happened? He had that guy parade around the room after he massaged him. And he tried to the best of his ability to walk taller. And everybody who knew him, he's walking, he's taller, he's better. And the poor guy said, I feel better. You know, and, and off he went. Still, he's going to wake up the next morning with all the same stuff of the stroke. We haven't had anybody say, do you know a great miracle? That pilot is back doing his job or whatever. He's out mowing his lawn now. We didn't, we haven't heard any of that because these guys are liars. They're liar. They're, they're as big a liars as Joseph Smith. They prey upon people with their con. They do it for money. They do it for power and they do it in Jesus name. And if you have, uh, again, I'm not saying God doesn't heal people. I am not saying he doesn't do miraculous things, but this type who do it in God's name for money and on TV and this type, uh, I, I would, I, I give thee the challenge, 500 bucks, but you got to prove it. All right. With that, I think we have a spot ready. Let's show it to you. We'll take some emails and get the heck out of here. back heart of the matter listen a lot of people ask these questions what I'm gonna say here is gonna sound di difficult for some of you but if you think about it you might not consider me the greatest heretic in the world a lot of people ask about these topics abortion homosexuality in this day and age they'll say what do you say Sean what do you think about that first of all what I say is not important I'm a man I have opinions, I have friends, I know people who've had abortions, I know people who are gay. My opinion's irrelevant, so we have to go to the next thing. What does the Bible say? Bottom line, without question, sin. It's a sin to, for a man to sleep with man, for women to sleep with women. Uh, it's a sin to ruin the fruit of a woman's womb. The Old Testament talked about the punishment for that. Sin, sin, sin. Absolutely, without uh, missing the mark. Talked about... Uh, Someone said the other day how you have the arrow, and you all have heard this, you, you point the arrow, and if you miss the bullseye, that's the word for sin. You've missed the mark. God's mark is man doesn't sleep with man, and women don't uh, kill their, the fruit of their uh, womb, and, uh, but it's also missing the mark to murder, and it's also missing the mark to gossip. And it's missing the mark to tell lies. It's missing the mark to lust. It's missing the mark to do just, I mean, the law shows us how much mark missing we do. So when we look at anybody, anybody at all, whether they be the homosexual, someone who's had an abortion, someone who may have one, someone who may fall into homosexuality and practice or fall back. They're no different than someone who falls into gossip, than someone who falls into, and this upsets people to no end. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's reaper. Yeah, you know, there is, and those things will be taken out in our flesh. People who, you know, live lasciviously, whether it's heterosexually or homosexually, they can get diseases. Girls can get pregnant. All those things that come along with it, fine. I get all that. It's it's, the repercussions are worse. But in the eyes of God, if you miss the mark on one thing, you're missing the mark. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. So why I say that is there's no focus necessary on these specific areas of sin. None. I don't care how militant the homosexual community gets in wanting their gay marriage and wanting all this stuff. That's not our deal. Let me say this. It's going to sound even worse. I think the topics of homosexuality and or uh, abortion have as much meaning to the Christian church as they do to a, a butcher shop or they would to a car dealership. 
What do those topics have to do with the ongoing workings of a car dealership or a butcher shop? Homosexuality, abortion. What do they have to do with the day-to-day -day workings of a butcher shop and the guy who's doing his work? Or a car dealership or hotel management and all that. They have nothing to do with it. They are topics of conversation. We can talk about them in terms of sin. If I'm a pastor and someone says I'm thinking about having an abortion, well, let me tell you about what it says about that, and let me counsel you that it, it would be very wise to avoid that. Or I'm a homosexual, well, let's talk about that. But that, it doesn't relate in any other way. This is why the gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament does not make those sins part of anything. Homosexuality in, in Rome was huge. The Greeks, forget about it. Man, boy, love, they love that stuff. And Jesus doesn't talk, talk to it. Why? Because he came to save a fallen world, one that is already judged and going down the, in the drain. Sorry, not going down, in the drain. And he came to save it in its sin. And so when we make these topics, Christian topics, it's missing the mark. That's sinful in my opinion. Our message in the church is to preach Jesus, the solution to our gossip and to homosexuality, the solution to people who've had an abortion or people who are uh, stealing bread or pins from their employer. You see, it's not the Christian thing. It's never been part of the gospel. He didn't say to Paul and Peter, go out and talk about social issues. He said to them, go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the solution to these sins. We've lost our way, Christian church, in this area. And, and that is uh, something that's hard to hear because to us, we think that we have to morally legislate the activities of a fallen world. It's still fallen. There's not, no solution here to fix it. You can fix, I mean, how come, how come the Christian church doesn't focus on murder? How come there's not a greater focus on stopping murder? How come we don't go out and picket people who are taking other people's lives? How come we don't picket gossipers? How come we haven't focused on gossiping and made that a major push? You know, instead we have our pet things because they're so repulsive to our way of life that we can't see outside of who we are to see how other people might feel and believe and do things. And that the gospel of Jesus Christ is to introduce the king who can make an evil, uh, I mean, not evil, a level playing ground for all of us, whoever we are and whatever we've done. So that's my stance, um, and I'll argue on it, right or wrong, that's how I believe it is, and we can go from there. From Richard, are you seriously taking Sean McCraney and his message of hate into your broadcast lineup? This was sent to the NRB network, they forwarded it to me. Are you aware of his arrogant and bombastic nature? Sean is good at exposing Mormonism and its cult-like nature and falsehoods. Are you aware that he anointed himself? I didn't know I did that. Uh, except that time with that soft lotion. No. Uh, 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 anointed himself the judge and jury over what is correct in Christianity. I, I just try to say what I think the Bible says. That's what I try to do. I'm wrong a lot, but I'm not the judge and jury. I just simply am going to say what I think is right. Last winter, he took a break from his regular broadcast scheduled in Salt Lake. After his break, he announced his new agenda to go after certain evangelical Christian groups in Utah. Over his break, he visited some churches. He concluded they were in error, and he anointed himself as the new gatekeeper of all that is right in Christian dumb. It is Christian dumb, by the way. Uh, he announced formally that Mormonism was no longer his focus. For this year, it's not. Uh, after this year, it will be again. And we've made that clear to everybody involved. He is now going to expose all that is wrong in Christianity, according to Sean. Not true. Um, again, my views uh, differ uh, in many ways from what many other people think. But I am going to say this is what the Bible says, and when we open up the phone calls, when people can start saying, no, it doesn't, we can then dialogue on that and, and debate as to whether I'm right or wrong. If you doubt this report, take a look at this. I loathe Mormonism, but Sean McCraney, uh, uh, question mark, <coughs> I hope you dig deep, a little deeper into the man's character, it's no good, his history, it's lousy, and his agenda. My agenda is to share Christ in truth and love. That's my agenda. The other two, I will fail. F, F. But in terms of agenda, it is to share the light of Christ, his truth, his redeeming love with anybody who wants it. It's to cut through the garbage of religion and to say, listen, there is a way. And it is him. It is only him. He loves you. He saved you in your sin. Go to him. Give him a chance. No matter who you are, Mormon, Christian, raise this, raise that. Give your heart over to him and let him have a chance at healing it and your life. We pray for this here. We'll see you next week here on Heart of the Matter.